Poetry comes up so often in my conversations these days and in unexpected contexts. It's something many of us seem to be hungry for, though often without knowing it until we hear it. I think we're starved for fresh ways to talk about difficult things, for language that would elevate and embolden rather than demean and alienate. Elizabeth Alexander was the fourth poet in American history to contribute to a presidential inauguration, the first of Barack Obama in 2009. Her poem on that day included these lines. We encounter each other in words, words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider, reconsider. This hour, Elizabeth Alexander shares her sense of what poetry works in us and in our children and why it may become more relevant, not less so, in hard and complicated times. You know, poetry has always existed and always existed in a communal context. Part of what people get from that is the story of who I am and who we are. I got to tell you my story. I got to tell you what happened. Let's think about who we are. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Elizabeth Alexander is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and she's the inaugural Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry at Yale University. She's also the author of several books of essays and poetry, including Crave Radiance. And she's just written a beautiful memoir of grief and love, The Light of the World. I interviewed Elizabeth Alexander in 2010. Her family background, though not linked to poetry, tells a vivid American story. Her extended family was a force in mid-century Harlem culture. She herself grew up in Washington, D.C., where her parents became players in the political dramas of the 1960s. Her mother is an historian. Her father served as Secretary of the Army, the first African American to hold this post under Lyndon Johnson. And at the age of one, she was with them at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech near the spot on the Washington Mall, where she would one day read a poem of her own creation. So when you look back at your childhood now, um, where do you see the seeds of your life as a poet? Um, I was the proverbial, you know, child with the jug ears. I was a, a listener. I liked mm. almost nothing more than listening to the grown-ups talk. I had one grandfather with whom we spent a great deal of time, uh, who's from Jamaica, and another grandmother who came from Alabama uh, and then Washington, D.C., mm. and then ended up in New York. And my parents are both really, really New Yorkers. And I loved what mm. seemed like my grandfather's quite specialized vocabulary that sometimes was the same as in the English uh, children's books that I loved so much. Oh, he would right. use words, you know, like uh-huh. chap and s- so forth and so on. And I just thought, you know, who would have thought that my Jamaican grandfather and Mary Poppins would have something to say to each other, <laughs> right. but they, th- they were both actually incredibly formative mm-hmm. to me. So um, it, it doesn't sound like from what I've read that you were destined to be a poet or i mean you were you were growing up in fact in washington in a very political time and a very political environment although yes. as you say there was certainly a literary sensibility and a care for words and language and ideas but you know as you became a poet then a little bit to your surprise um what did you begin to learn in particular about you know where poetry comes from in you and what it does in the world as a as a way of speaking and expressing truth yeah, I think my becoming a poet um, was was not expected nor preordained or planned in any kind of way. Um, I grew up in a household of very, very smart and well-educated people, but not um, in a household of poetry readers uh, in particular. And I think that, you know, most of the people who I went to school with, those Washington kids at good schools, um, became lawyers or got involved Mm -hmm. in politics or became other kinds of professionals, but not creative professionals. So it it was a funny thing. I I guess um, we were always expected to be very, very practical as black children of a particular era. There was no question, 
no question whatsoever uh, about our being serious about school, doing well in school. They didn't even have to articulate it. Um, <laughs> you, 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 you just didn't mess up. <laughs> um, they wouldn't quite have said, you know, people died for <laughs> for you to go to school, but it was, you know, mm. it was implicit all the time. Um, so... I, I think in, in part, I mean, having a PhD, becoming a professor, making another kind of professional life that existed alongside the stranger, more mysterious uh, life of an artist, life of a poet, um, was the piece that I took from the environment that I grew up in. That, mm. you know, you can be an artist, but you got to do something practical hmm. alongside it. You've got to figure out how you're going to take care of yourself in the world. Right. So, you know, I, I, I started to say this um, before our interview began. One thing I'm aware of in our, in our programs, I mean, we've, poetry comes up more and more in my conversations. And when we put poetry on the air, there's something so magnetic about that, right? And I'm aware of that at the same time that I'm very aware that I think we are experiencing the failure of what you refer to in places as official language and discourse mm-hmm. and like arguments and statistics and, uh, yes. right? And it, it's clearly not serving us. So, and yet I don't think people, we necessarily have a collective imagination about what we need instead. Well, yes, I mean, amen to everything that you've just said. And um, I think I think here's what we crave. We crave truth tellers. We crave real truth. There is so much baloney all the time. You know, the performance of political speech, of speech, as you say, on the news. Doesn't it often feel to you like there should be a, a thought bubble over it <laughs> that that says, you know, what I really would say if, right. I, if if I could say it is, you know, these people who I oppose, I don't like them and I don't want to work with them because uh, they're obstructionist, uh, but I have to act like I want to partner with them because that's the accepted form of discourse. But in yes. fact, it's not really getting us anywhere. Yes. Or, um, you know, how I think of on things like, I don't know, comedy shows when there's a little ticker tape underneath that's, you know, she's lying. Right. <laughs> um, um, that's uh, how I experience um, sometimes um, that sort of speech as well. So I think, you know, I, I learn so much every day from being a, a mother. My sons are um, 11 and 12. And you see the way that, that children, understand, that they know when they're being bamboozled. <laughs> uh, yes, they, they do. Um, and they also are drawn toward language that shimmers, Hmm. (laughs) individual words with power. Um, They will stop you and ask you to repeat a shimmering word if they're hearing it for the first time. You can see it in their faces. Um, so, can you um, think I of think... a word that you're? T- I have a twelve-year-old son, also, by the way. So okay. But, um, so, can you think of a word? I'm just trying to think of one as I. Well, actually, if if they were right here, they would love hoodwinked and bamboozled. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. I can tell yep. you that. You know, people sometimes ask me when they read poems that have an "I" uh, in them that uh, seems to be autobiographical, that seems to to be something from my life. People are interested in the details. Oh, did that really happen to you? Is that from mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. And um, what I try to explain is um, even if I am drawing on personal experience, the truth of a poem is actually much deeper than whether or not something really happened. What matters is an undergirding truth that I think is the power of poetry. And I think that when uh, I veer from that, even by a syllable, it's my job to know if I veered from that. That's where the red pencil has to come out. As as you're talking, the poem I'm thinking of, but maybe you would have another one in mind, is the Ars Poetica, I Believe. Ah, uh, yeah. Which mm-hmm. is kind would of about... Would you like me to read that? Yes, which mm-hmm. I think is about... But one of your poems that is about what poetry is about. Yes, and it's got that 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 I in it. I Uh in it. So let's turn to that. Ars Poetica number 100, I Believe. Poetry, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Poetry is where we are ourselves, though Sterling Brown said, every I is a dramatic I digging in the clam flats for the shell that snaps, emptying the proverbial pocketbook. 
Poetry is what you find in the dirt, in the corner, over here, on the bus, God in the details, the only way to get from here to there. Poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. Poetry, here I hear myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? Hmm. So I think that the truth of that poem um, is not about true things or things that happened, um, but rather um, in the question, are we not of interest to each other? Yes. Which, to, you know, to me isn't about, oh, you know, I, I, I like her shoes <laughs> or, uh, oh, he has a fascinating job. Uh, it's much deeper than that. Are human beings who are in community, do we call to each other? Do we heed each other? Do we want to know each other? And I think reaching across what can be a huge void between human beings, you know, it's so amazing that we are each unto ourselves inside of our heads. I look at my yes. children and I think, as deeply as I know you, I do not know what is in your heads, but I crave knowing them that deeply. And so, you know, it's most intense with one's beloveds, um, but I think it's a way to move in the world. And mm -hmm. if we don't do that with language that's very, very, very precise, not prissy, but precise, then are we knowing each other truly? And I think for our public life right now, these are really difficult and burning questions, right? They're really, it's a really pointed question right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost impossible. I mean, that question, are we not of interest to each other, is drowned and destroyed mm -hmm. by the forms we have, by the way we talk and the way we've postured. Um, but I wonder if you think that poetry, for, for all of us, <laughs> um, actually gives us a way to point at those interior spaces that would reawaken, you know, as you say, this essential interest in each other, which makes new futures possible. Well, I, I think that it does. Um, I uh, In high school, I, I went to a Quaker high school in Washington, Sidwell Friends School. And um, we uh, had a meeting for worship once a week. It was, I don't know, 45 minutes or something like that of sitting together in silence. And when moved to speak, pe people would speak. It didn't happen very often. <laughs> and then around graduation, everyone would get up and cry. And that was the speaking. <laughs> Right. Um, and or you know, or there was always one teacher who spoke, and and uh, as slightly cynical teenagers, you know, we weren't going to speak, but nonetheless, the quiet was very important. I even understood that then. But more importantly, the the perhaps three minutes of silence with which we began the day, I I cherished that then. Um, that overrode all teenage uh, restless mm -hmm. silliness. I knew that that moment of inner listening would have a analogs throughout the day, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, that that sort of chunk, and right now you can't see me because we're on the radio, but I'm um, holding my fingers together in a little rectangle. Okay. Um, you know, so like that chunk, that smaller than a brick sized chunk of contemplative silence with which to simply listen and take stock would be something that I would need to call on throughout the day. I think that's a very, very important way to be able to go through life. And I think that poetry can provide those kinds of chunks. You know, mm -hmm. right before um, the inaugural, the day before, there was a sound check and um, the sound guy uh, asked me to, um, and you know, the microphone, oh my goodness, 
just this amazing <laughs> instrument, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> this like finely calibrated, you know, kind of the hope diamond of microphones. Right. Um, and so he said, okay, why don't you say some poetry? That was his phrase, say some poetry. <laughs> So we can see how it works on the mic. And the day before, Washington was full of people. People were already coming to the inaugural, and the mall was quite full with with lots of of folks. And it was just me up on the stage, and no one was looking at me. And I recited one of my favorite poems, Gwendolyn Brooks's Kitchenette Building, which starts out, We are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong, like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. And then I continued Mm -hmm. with the poem, which asks about, could a dream rise up through onion fumes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the halls? It's extraordinary, beautiful, (sighs) tiny, tiny sonnet. And let me tell you, hundreds of people literally stopped in their tracks to hear this you know, uh, uh, unknown to them person recite a poem by someone unknown, no doubt, to most of them. And these hundreds of people, I watched them sort of gather in a darkening sort of cluster. And then when the poem was over, they clapped. <laughs> in other words, they knew it was some, something about the form of the poem. Mm-hmm. Right. I didn't say who I was or what I was doing or ask for their attention. The poem asked for their attention inherently. Hmm. And the poem is about people in Chicago. She's describing poor people in the 1940s living in these kitchenette apartments um, under, you know, really difficult circumstances, trying to find a way to imagine something else, something beautiful. Hmm. It's about a very important topic that transcends time and space. You know, how can the imagination and the spirit um, lift us above our quotidian difficulties? You can read that Gwendolyn Brooks poem, Kitchenette Building, at onbeing.org. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today with poet Elizabeth Alexander. Here she is reading the final stanzas of her poem, Praise Song for the Day, at the inauguration of Barack Obama on January 20th, 2009. What if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love that casts a widening pool of light. Love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun. On the brink, on the brim, on the cusp, Praise song for walking forward in that light. So, you know, one thing that you did in that inaugural poem, um, Praise Song for the Day, I just want to get it out here in front of me. Um, having said a minute ago in the, in the Ars Poetica that poetry is not about love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs> you this poem is <laughs> you invoked love um into a political moment into a a public space it's, it's hard for me to imagine that uh, a, that could have been done politically and, and have any yes. integrity but it had incredible weight and also i think strangeness you know mm. uh it was so out of place and yet mm-hmm. so powerful and it worked so what is the effect of putting that word out there? These have been hard years, these years since yes. the inaugural, inauguration, with all kinds of pressing problems where to, to, you know, to talk about love would, would almost seem even more superfluous than it might have on that day. Um, yes. Well, you know, um, when I say poetry is not all love, 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 I mean romantic love is where we go first with the word, but really there is so much more to the word. The word is sober. The word is grave. The word is not just about um, something light and happy and pleasurable. The word calls up 
deep, deep responsibility. Right, you're, the question you posed is, what if the mightiest word is love? <laughs> and, and that's a real question. And I think um, in a lot of my poems, I was thinking about this um, as I was um, uh, coming towards this, this interview, I was thinking about the act of asking real questions mm-hmm. in poems as a kind of spiritual practice. Um, No, I ask questions relatively often in poems and I ask them because I don't know the answer. And I ask them because I think that poems are fantastic spaces with which to arrive at real conundrum-y kinds of questions, to go as far down the road as you can of understanding something. And then Sometimes that road ends with a real question. So right. what if the mightiest word with, uh, is love is, it's a question of fact uh, that perhaps asks in these times as an incredibly uh, heterogeneous collective, as an incredibly diverse country, is there such a thing as a love that can supersede or guide uh, or, or take us through disagreement. Um, What would that mean? What would that love look like? Um, Mighty, you know, that's a a very, very particular kind of of word. Is there a kind of um, enduring power of love, as I so fervently want to believe? But then I think, I mean, once again, love with no need to preempt grievance, Mm -hmm. love that is not about marital love. It's not just about familial love. It's not even about national love. In fact, love cannot just be for uh, the people in our nation, even though right now we're having this incredible national moment um, that, but but, but I say now I'm in the moment of the inaugural. I I think what you're you're injecting the word love into our encounter with otherness, right? which is more and more just a defining fact, even of our national life, right? Even mm-hmm. of our family lives. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I mean, what was something I think about a lot is how the word that we took after the '60s to to live together with otherness was tolerance, and that's not nearly a large and mighty enough word. But love is a much more demanding word. Yes. It's mu- it demands much more. Well, yes, and especially if it's a, a, you know, love with no need to preempt grievance. Yeah. You know, love that can um, even do more than tolerate d- dissent and difference, right? I mm-hmm. mean, that, that can, can sit with it, uh, right. can take it in, can listen to it, can let it stand whole, Um can, you know, not necessarily feel the need to engage it argumentatively. Right. Um, There are a lot of ways, I think, that people who are aggrieved can be addressed. We all have our grievances. Um, And again, this I think we understand on the intimate level. Um, When grievance is really heard on the intimate level, I think that does a great deal of, of, of the work of moving people forward Mm -hmm. to to living together even if the problem isn't solved right Mm -hmm. that's right so something that i'm really interested in is this the connection between what is universal and what is particular Mm -hmm. and how what is particular illuminates the universal so so recently i had a conversation with the chief rabbi of great britain who Mm-hmm. said this striking thing that he thinks moral imagination begins with universality and ends with particularity, which is kind of the reverse of how we've come to think of it maybe superficially of diversity in Western culture is that the goal is to get to a place where we realize how like we are, right? Where we can celebrate mm-hmm. what we have in common. Yeah. But you're very much about, you, you use words like, phrases like Negro esoterica, quirks, oddnesses, particularities mm-hmm. that your mm-hmm. poems archive and preserve. So how do you think about why it matters, what the force is of bringing these very particular, you know, this black experience to our common life? I'm not sure I'm asking the question right, but maybe yeah. you get what well, you understand Well, I have a bunch of responses, at. though. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we are always speaking out of our particular. And that was true in ancient Greece, and that's true in 
England, and that's true in all kinds of languages, and that's true for white people, and that's true for everybody. We speak out of what we know and what we have lived, and then um, hopefully from that um, comes something that we might call the universal. Um, But I also think that, um, you know, because our education uh, is not integrated enough, and by this I don't just mean um, with African-American materials, but I mean um, with really, really a a deep and wide range of um, approaches, cultural approaches to what's important, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Even though it's certainly come a long way from when I was a kid, um, I think that that's part of why um, people still look at, um, they don't realize that African American experience is one way of telling the American story, and right, that it, in right. fact, actually, it's a it's a profoundly centered way of telling the American story. And in fact, if you don't get it, and if you move around it in some way, if you don't pass through it, I think people will profoundly misunderstand uh, uh, America. Mm. Um, so I think, and, th- and this speaks more in, in a way to my, um, educator self because my poet self, you know, she's all intuition. Um, she's not, there's no program. She's just, you, you know, doing as Adrian Rich says, you know, diving into the wreck and her job again, to quote that great poem from Rich, she says, um, I want the wreck itself not the story of the wreck. I want the wreck itself. That's what you're supposed to be doing as a poet. So that's what, what you know, that part of me is doing. But the educator part of me um, argues much more forcefully for the um, necessary centering of African-American culture and experience if one is thinking about the United States. Right. Well, yeah, the American story, but also the human story. I mean, which is <laughs> for sure, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. All the poems you've heard so far, including Ars Poetica, I Believe, and others coming up, are available at onbeing.org. Look for all eight poems Elizabeth Alexander recited during our 90-minute interview. Read the texts and download MP3s of her reading them for free. Share them and this show with your friends and family. And we're always looking for fresh, unexpected voices to contribute to our blog. If you write poetry or essays, produce multimedia features or photographs, become a guest contributor. Find the submission link on our homepage, onbeing.org, and through our email updates. Coming up, the relevance of poetry in hard economic times and Elizabeth Alexander's poetic musings on how childbirth is like jazz. I'm Krista Tippett. On Being continues in a moment. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, my 2010 conversation with Elizabeth Alexander, a poet and a scholar of African-American history and culture. We're discussing where the hunger for poetry comes from in human life, and we're exploring the role poetry might play in nourishing our common life, in giving us fresh ways to talk to each other about difficult things. I drove in knowing this morning that I was going to interview you, and I was just depressed as I as I tend to be these days by just hearing about what's going on with the economy, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, it was easier for me a few years ago when um, the big headlines were all about violence. It was easy for me to say, mm. that's not the whole human story. That's not the whole truth of mm-hmm. humanity. It's not the whole truth of religion. Um, it's a piece of the narrative, and we have to train our eyes to see the rest. But when I, when the problems, as they are right now, on a global scale are economic, when it's about whether people can eat, right? Yeah. Whether they can buy winter coats for their children. Um, mm-hmm. Then then I wonder if it's even a luxury to say, you know, that we train our eyes. I wonder if it's a luxury to talk about poetry. A minute ago, though, when you were telling that story about before the inauguration and the sound check, 
Yeah. And you read those lines from Gwendolyn Brooks. Now, what was that again? Can a dream rise up? <laughs> yeah, but could lines? a dream rise up through onion fumes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall? Fight to sing an aria down these halls. And would we let it in and keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin? So then that's the next question. And, and, and maybe, you know, Brooks has been very important to me. And maybe this business of poems asking real questions is perhaps something I kind of um, imbibed uh, unknowingly from Brooks. Because could a dream rise up through onion fumes? Deep question number one with no answer. Yeah. But then the next deep question, what would we do with it? Would we take care of it? Would we keep it very clean? What does it mean for us to nurture that piece of ourselves and each other in the midst of the day-to-day exigencies of, in her words again, rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man? What place does dreams have in all of that? What do we do with that? You know, do, do, do we keep our dreams inextinguishable? Um, how do we feed that part of ourselves and each other. Um, that's what she's asking. And that's a, that's a very powerful question to me. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a very powerful question. And so is poetry a luxury? Well, Audre Lorde's famous essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury. Um, I would uh, side with that. I think that one of the... Um, great things about poetry, and many poets and many black women poets have written about this, that human beings have always made song. Communities, tribes, peoples have always told each other the story of who they are in song. And I use the word song to be roughly analogous with poetry because it's not just words on the page. We're always aspiring to song when we write poems. Otherwise, you know, we don't want them to lie dead and flat. Hmm. We want those words to lift up. Um, And we want them also to live in the body in the way that song lives in the body and lifts you up and fills you with with, with a real quantity when you're singing. Um, There's a thing in you when you sing a song. Um, And so, you know, poetry has always existed and always existed in a communal context. So I feel like, well, people must need it because people always did it and never stopped doing it. Mm. Um, And that part of what people get from that is the story of who I am and who we are. I got to tell you my story. I got to tell you what happened. Let's think about who we are. And I I think that also gets at why, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but in poetry, it's like that word love. It's, It's more exacting. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You see, a lot of educated Americans maybe get their only doses of poetry through those pages they may or may not dwell on in The New Yorker, right? Yes. <laughs> well, um, yeah. But here's the thing. You have to be vulnerable to take poetry. And you, you either have to be, I mean, it can hurt. Like, like beautiful music yes. can hurt. Yes. Um, maybe that's the embodied part of it that you're saying, but... You almost have to, I have seen for myself, I have to feel either strong enough or destroyed enough to, re- ah, to, re- that's to a, take in poetry. That's a beautiful way of, of putting it. Um, I, I think of uh, Toni Morrison is, is one novelist who I think of as, um, she's as good as a poet. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think right. that there's something so just incredibly distilled um, in her novels, that um, it uh, reading them affects me in the same way that reading poems affects me, just a- almost as a as a physical experience. And um, I remember for years I didn't read Beloved because I just thought I just can't take it. Actually, mm-hmm. just can't take it. Got to wait till I can take it. And that when I read it, I read it in very, very small pieces, like like a long book of poems, actually. Yes. Uh, you know, just sort of chunk by chunk, because um, it had that dual effect that you're talking about, and that that kind of um, a very, very, very visceral power. So, but I think poetry, you know, what I, what I also like to continue what uh, a number of writers, Lucille Clift and Wanda Coleman, they've talked about poetry as a, an art form that is um, uh, a poor people's art form. 
which is to say you don't need, you, you can't write a novel without a lot of time to yourself. <laughs> you, you, you know, it just, they don't get written any other way. Um, but I love how these women talk about how you can snatch time to make a poem. That doesn't mean that they aren't hard to make, but it means that, you know, they are like uh, grass or flowers coming up in the sidewalk cracks. Um, and that, you know, Wanda Coleman says, I can start a poem if I'm waiting online. Mm. Poor people spend a lot of time waiting online. Mm. I couldn't write a novel waiting online, but I could start a poem waiting online. Lucille Clifton says, uh, the best conditions for me to write poetry are at the kitchen table. One kid's got the measles. Uh, another t- two kids are smacking each other. You know, life is going on around me. And not only is that the stuff of the poems, but also that she can snatch little tiny snippets of space for the poems. She had six children and uh, she was very, very funny. And she said, why do you think my poems are so short? (laughs) Because that's what results when you're grabbing time like that. But I mean, they are uh, incredibly powerfully meditative, amazing, amazing poems. Um, so I think that there's a way that um, that poetry, you don't make any money from writing it and you don't need any money to make it. I'm Krista Tippett and this is On Being. Today I'm with poet Elizabeth Alexander. The poem she wrote for the 2009 presidential inauguration was published in a collection titled Crave Radiance. This volume includes poems from her early celebrated The Venus Hottentot and successive works. It spans themes from the history of slavery to her personal history of becoming a mother. There's some place where you, it's another interview where you quote a a feminist colleague who said if, if Descartes had been a woman, he wouldn't have said, I think, therefore I am. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I or mean, what, yeah, her question was, what if Descartes could get pregnant? Yeah. How would that have changed the Western canon? And 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 tell me how how being a mother then changed you as a poet. Um, well, I think that first of all, uh, um, it grew me right up. Um, I think that the image of the writer with, you know, just hours and hours and hours of unbroken time and the perfect space and the perfect view out the window and the perfect uh, flowers on the table and the perfect rituals. Um, you know, when you're raising children. Yeah, um, it, it and grows I'm, all of us up in that way. That we're, whether we're that's right. You just, you just realize like, well, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, just do it. Yeah. Don't even think about doing it. Don't talk about doing it. Don't, you know, just do it. And so um, actually it was with my first child and um, nursing in the middle of the night um, and being, of course, so tired, but also wonderfully unguarded. I found that actually being that tired was fantastic for my poetry mm. because I couldn't, um, I had no uh, uh, filters. Um, and I just, you know, I'd have the baby in one arm and it would be three in the morning. Uh, and I'd write some things down on any scrap of paper. And I just grabbed the time I had. Um, I think also... When my children are one year apart, and in that time, my very, very beloved mother-in-law was in the end of her life and actively dying and then died. And so having those experiences of, of giving birth and the privilege, she was a very, very deeply spiritual woman. Um, and for me to be able to see someone have a faith that made her fearless, although she also was a fearless woman Mm -hmm. who shepherded a large family through times of war and just a brave woman. So, So for me, it was a privilege to be intimately with her in those years of her life. And I think I I came to really understand something very deep that served my poetry about the kind of, um, I've called it before the porous scrim between life and death Mm. Um, Mm. and about what it means as a poet to be able to be the person who can sit with those profound, profound, essential human experiences and 
let them happen and not fight them and learn from them. I never would have thought before that it was a privilege for someone to let you be intimately with them as they move towards dying. Hmm. But it was, and I think I understood that because uh, I was having and raising these these little babies. Would you read the poem, um, Giving Birth is Like Jazz? <laughs> Oh, neonatology. Yes. Uh, I, um, I really love that one. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Uh, let me see. How is it? It's. I could read the. Um, it's a. So it's a poem over many um, sections. But uh, I, yeah, well, I, I was see. Looking at this page is the conclusion. Fifty-three in. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this is the last poem of um, a long poem called Neonatology. Giving birth is like jazz. Something from silence, then all of it. Long, elegant boats, blood-boiling sunshine, human cargo, a handmade kite. Postpartum. No longer a celebrity, pregnant lady, expectant. It has happened. You are here. Each dram you drain a step away from flushed and floating, lush and curled, now you are the pink one, the movie star. It has happened. You are here, and you sing, mule, holler, peep, swallow the light, and bubble it back. Shine, contain multitudes, gleam. You are the new one, the movie star, and birth is like jazz, from silence and blood, silence, then everything. Jazz. A and if I might, I I'd like to put another poem next to that. Yes. Um, which sort of um, illustrates what I was talking about, about the, the proximity of those two experiences. This poem is called Autumn Passage. On suffering, which is real. On the mouth that never closes, the air that dries the mouth. On the miraculous dying body, its greens and purples. On the beauty of hair itself. On the dazzling toddler, like eggplant, he says, when you say vegetable, chrysanthemum to flower. On his grandmother's suffering, larger than vanished skyscrapers, September zucchini, other things too big, for her glory that goes along with it. Glory of grown children's vigil, communal fealty, glory of the body that operates even as it falls apart. The body that can no longer even make fever, but nonetheless burns, florid and bright and magnificent, as it dims, as it shrinks, as it turns to something else. Mm. I'm so glad you read that, too, next to the other one. I, I, I never put them together, but of course they, they go together, they do. don't they? They yeah. absolutely do. Crave Radiance is the title of this collection of new and um, collected poems of yours. And I mean, just those words, Crave Radiance, and this sentence, we crave radiance in this austere world. I mean, that in and of itself is an example of something you can say in poetry that is is deeper than a fact, right? Mm -hmm. But is there something in you that grieves how... Uh, how hard it is to see a place for poetry. You know, it was so appropriate on that day of the inauguration, although it was very special to have a, a an mm -hmm. occasional poem, right? I mean, there what there have been four yes. in history. Um, is there something in you that grieves that the space is so much smaller in which that might seem to be appropriate? Well, I guess I could say yes, and I would be telling the truth. But I think um, a deeper truth is that, my goodness, there are a lot of people and places in the world and in this country, so many communities, so many levels of human interaction. So uh, w where I live, you know, both kind of in my head <laughs> and uh, in my virtual and writing life and in my teaching life, I, I still literally at, just about every day I get uh, an email or a, a letter um, from someone 
who I wouldn't necessarily call a poetry person. These are not other poets or people who have followed my work. Um, writing to me about where poetry is in their world, sending me their poems. Mm. Um, uh, a story I've I've told before, but it's just such an amazing story to me. The um, the head of the United Farm Workers wrote to me and uh, sent me a United Farm Workers flag, which is very meaningful because um, boycotting grapes when I was growing up is the first political action I remember oh, okay. taking, the first act of protest. But they said, you know, in the inaugural poem, thank you for choosing the word lettuce. Because that, w- so the line is, you know, talking about the people who say it plain that many have died for this day and then uh, sing the names of the dead who brought us here. It talks about people who picked the cotton and the lettuce. So with that word lettuce, they said, you made visible the work of the people who feed the nation mm. with one word. So I feel um, it's a privilege and that's why I talk about it for me to see that actually there are ways that poetry and poetic language are connecting, and not just mine, um, with people all over the place. We just don't get to hear about it very much. We just have a couple more minutes. Is there a poem you'd like to read to to finish? Um, Why don't I read, um, we've been speaking about Lucille Clifton. The last poem in Crave Radiance? I thought so. I thought so too, but I didn't. Oh, good. I'm so glad. (laughs) Um, I just well, decided I would let you make that call, but if you'd asked me to, that's what I would have said as well. Good. Oh, I'm happy <laughs> to hear that. Um, well, I, along with so many others, oh, how I miss Lucille Clifton, uh, mm. who died last February, um, and just a, a very, very great poet whose reputation, I think, will grow and grow as her work is more studied and talked about and written about and and there's and more published, too. There's a, a, apparently a lot of unpublished work. Um, and also just a beautiful, loving, uh, loving, loving woman to so many of us younger poets. So um, to know her was really to love her, mm-hmm. and uh, and so I miss her. And one of the things I learned from her poems, she never talked about this with me, but I learned in her poems, as I mentioned earlier, you know, she has poems where she has a very kind of casual conversation with her unborn grandchild, and then in the next poem she'll have a casual conversation with her husband who's been dead for 15 years. You know, for, she was very fluid, through the portals of life and death. Mm-hmm. She had mm-hmm. a very deep kind of ancestral understanding um, and whatever the word would be that is analogous to ancestral but that moves us into the future, right? Mm-hmm. Um, she was just on a continuum in that way and I learned a whole lot from that. So uh, this poem is called One Week Later in the Strange. One Week Later in the Strange Exhilaration After Lucille's Death. Our eyes were bright as we received instructions, lined up with all we were supposed to do. Now seers, now grace notes, now anchors, now tellers, now keepers and spreaders, now wide open arms. The cold wind of generational shift blew all around us, stinging our cheeks, awakening us to the open space, now everywhere surrounding. Elizabeth Alexander is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and she's the inaugural Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry at Yale University. Her books of poetry include Crave Radiance, and she's recently written her first memoir, a beautiful book about life in and beyond grief called The Light of the World. In the essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, which Elizabeth Alexander cited earlier, Audre Lorde says that poetry forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. 
Read that essay in full at onbeing.org. And while you're there, you'll also find all the poems Elizabeth Alexander read this hour and others we couldn't include for the sake of time. We posted the poems so you can freely listen, download, and share MP3s of each of them, including One Week Later in the Strange, that ode to Lucille Clifton and neonatology. Find all of this and more at onbeing.org. On Being is Trent Gillis, Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Nikki Oster, Michelle Keeley, Maya Terrell, Annie Parsons, and Halima Shaw. Our major funding partners are the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide at FordFoundation.org. The Fetzer Institute, fostering awareness of the power of love and forgiveness to transform our world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, contributing to organizations that weave reverence, reciprocity, and resilience into the fabric of modern life. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of a new initiative, Public Theology Reimagined. And the Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. Our corporate sponsor is Mutual of America. Since 1945, Americans have turned to Mutual of America to help plan for their retirement and meet their long-term financial objectives. Mutual of America is committed to providing quality products and services to help you build and preserve assets for a financially secure future. On Being is distributed by American Public Media and is a Krista Tippett Public Production.